Well, we need to say, uh, Mr. Mr. Sapel's newspaper, the LA Times, they they won a Pulitzer uh, Pulitzer Prize for uh, their coverage, their second day coverage of the uh, LA riots. Um, and he will be speaking about some of the, the challenges and some of the things that that he and uh, the staff of, of the LA Times went through um, during during this uh, this event, I guess you can say, in American history. So, without any any further ado, Joel Sapel. Well. Um Thanks for having me here, and um, thanks for the good weather, too. <laughs> Reminds me of home. Um, anyway, I think it's important to say, in talking about uh, how the LA Times is <laughs> kind of tall for me, sorry. Ouch. Um, it's important to say that, uh, uh, that the staff of the LA Times really won this Pulitzer. I mean, it was a, a total effort of everybody involved. Um, the entire newspaper from the soft sections, the feature sections, the sports staff, the metro staff, um, everybody had a little piece of this. And I think that's what made it so remarkable to be part of is that, the, um, that no job was too small and no job was too big. Um, every job was important along the way uh, from getting a single quote. You know, we have a very large staff and we had deployed out on the street that day, uh, you know, by the end of the first night, probably close to 100 reporters. Um, and so it was a quote from one, a quote from another. And, uh, and then there were people that were simply watching television for us, reporters, seasoned quality reporters, watching television and messaging the editors of everything that they were seeing on television to help us deploy. So I just want to say that it really was the entire newspaper that I thought pulled together so well. And, um, you know, when we set out on that first day um, when violence overtook the city, um, none of us really expected that to happen. Um, I mean, in, in sort of the grand tradition of journalistic uh, soothsaying, um, we, thought every, we thought we knew it was going to happen, guilty for all the defendants. Um, the pol you know, police department thought it was going to be guilty for all the defendants. This is a case that had been... Uh, had traumatized the city and, uh, and, and had certainly called, uh, caught the attention of the world for the better part of a year. Um, how could you find these guys not guilty after seeing you know, um, them clubbing a guy on the ground? So everybody sort of assumed that there was going to be guilty verdicts. So uh, we had a couple hours notice initially from the court that the verdicts were going to be read. We deployed and we had a plan, a uh, plan that we thought would be mainly getting reaction from the community uh, on a matter that they, that they hoped to put behind them. Um, so we deployed our, our reporters um, and then waited. For those of us in the office, um, we gathered around television sets. We had TVs all through the newsroom. And uh, the staff was gathered around um, waiting for the inevitable guilty verdicts. And then all of a sudden, uh, the first defendant, Lawrence Powell, who is seen on the videotape, I'm sure you've all seen, um, striking most of the blows, the first, uh, he was the first defendant and was not guilty. At that moment, it was like one of those times when you have something in your life that you always remember. You know where you were. You can recapture the feeling that you had. Uh, that's what it was like for all of us at the LA Times and actually throughout the city. Uh, there was a gasp, basically. And uh, we knew that uh, it was going to be, at that point, a pretty long night. Uh, the following, the verdicts, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty for all the defendants came back. Um, and uh, we knew it was going to be a long night, and we didn't know that it was going to be sort of a defining moment in the history of the city and the newspaper itself. Um, we, uh, you know, the first thing we did was uh, uh, within, within probably, you know, just maybe an hour and a half or so, uh, we're watching TV. We watched a lot of TV that night because helicopters were everywhere and, uh, and TV cameras were everywhere, and it was sort of our eyes and ears uh, for a while. Uh, then less than two hours after the verdicts came back, the trouble really started. Um, a protest at the intersection of Florence and Normandy in South Central Los Angeles basically exploded. Um, it was a mob scene. A liquor store was being looted and burned. Television helicopters overhead. You know, all of a sudden we could see people being yanked from their cars and being beaten. One of those was the trucker that maybe you're aware of, Reginald Denny. 
um, uh, one of our reporters had been positioned to get comment uh, on the verdicts very close to that, sort of like a heat-seeking missile. She heard on the radio that there, were, um, that there was some disturbance at that intersection. She went there. She called me on her car phone as her car was being stoned. Um, and, uh, and to say that she was slightly unnerved would be an understatement. Uh, so we got her the hell out of the area, basically. And, uh, and, and at the same time, we realized that this thing was, was getting uh, out of control. So we called in more reporters. Uh, we have a lot of suburban additions. Everybody had been put on beepers in our grand planning, you know, beepers on everybody. So um, they got beeped, and everybody got, uh, got pulled in and then sent out. We started getting calls uh, from the reporters um, uh, that were stationed throughout uh, South Central Los Angeles with some pretty uh, vivid and chilling accounts of the violence. Um, you know, we had covered, you know, in LA, we covered uh, disasters before, earthquakes. We're, we're the specialists at covering earthquakes. And, uh, but with an earthquake, it's easy because you know what's causing it. You know, it's shifting of plates in the earth. But with a riot, it's entirely different. You know, it's just out of control. I mean, there's the disaster component of it, but there's as many reasons for the riot occurring as there are um, people involved in it. So it was, it was made it scary. There was something that was happening there. It was, uh, it was like the city was having sort of a nervous breakdown and uh, it was, had become an angry stranger to us. Throughout, uh, we were noticing that the police were nowhere in sight. And uh, that was something that, that we had to keep asking ourselves about. Um, on the streets, um, tales of terror and heroism began to emerge from the reporters. One of uh, our reporters, John Mitchell, was near Florence and Normandy when he saw a Korean-American woman in her car uh, and the car was being pelted with bricks and bottles and then a mob was trying to uh, pull her out of the car. And uh, John stepped in uh, at great risk to his own life and, uh, and pulled her out basically, sort of, you know, interceded on her behalf, pulled her out, and, uh, and guarded her, taking her to a hospital where she was, where she lived, and she was pretty battered up. But, um, and that took him out of the coverage that night, um, but for, <coughs> excuse me, but I would say for a very good reason. We had photographers in the field. Photographers were the most endangered um, because they had, uh, you might want to listen to this back there. Um, because they had the camera, their camera equipment all over them, and uh, and people weren't sure whether they were cops or whether they were photographers or what they were, and plus they had some nice-looking camera gear, and um, and one of our uh, photographers, Kirk uh, McCoy, he was on the street and um, with another partner, cameraman in a car right next to him. He was standing outside the car door. Door, door was open when somebody came up to him with a gun and put the gun um, right at his head and pulled the trigger. And it didn't, it didn't fire. Um, at which point, you know, the guy, the guy said, you know, like, damn it, you know, the gun didn't work or something. So then he recocked or did whatever he did and he put the gun at the photographer's neck at that point. And the other photographer in the car just, they both just, he grabbed the photographer, he sped off their head, they were down on the ground of the car while they were driving off. Um, we were hearing tales of this, you know, uh, too much, way too much. Another reporter I had sent into a Korea town, and uh, he called me, um, and telling me that he had just been shot at twice. We had a reporter who uh, was badly beaten up, teeth knocked out, uh, just for being in the wrong place in a mini mall. So it was this, it was this sort of, uh, it's with this background that the staff still went out and uh, and swallowed their fear and. Um, and, and did what I thought was a, an incredible job of pulling together some, in, some fantastic anecdotal material and putting readers right there. Um, what newspapers um, can't do is they can't compete with television. Television is there. There's nothing, I'm sure that you've, you saw the riot unfold on your television sets. There's nothing quite like fire raging and, and mobs swirling around uh, to make vivid television. Uh, but what we can do is, uh, newspapers, I think, and their role of the future, contrary to, well, this is my own personal belief about this, but coming from the LA Times, and contrary to what I think uh, USA Today does, um, you know, the shorter story, the quicker story, the superficial story, um, is that newspapers can provide sort of an analysis and context for events as they unfold. We can explain 
um, how things happen and why they happen. Sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong. Um, but that should be our role, and that's the role we try to assume in our daily coverage. Um, you know, as the, um, as the night progressed, that first night, uh, we noticed that an, another front had opened up. And uh, this one was right in the heart of the Civic Center where the Times building is. And this one, unbelievably, was a protest that took place uh, right at the police headquarters, the famed LAPD, uh, dragnet and, you know, kick-ass cops. Um, but that night, the cops weren't around. And uh, a mob of oh, several hundred, at least, uh, started uh, protesting in front of the police headquarters, started stoning the police headquarters, burnt down a parking kiosk at uh, the police headquarters, uh, overturned police cars, and the cops never came out. Um, this sort of has a tendency to embolden a crowd when they can attack the police headquarters and, and uh, nobody does anything. So what they started doing then was um, uh, started taking it up the street a bit. And uh, myself and about uh, maybe 10 other people were um, on the, this second floor balcony we have at the Times that overlooks uh, the street. Um, it's the smoker's balcony where we're, we've been exiled. And uh, so we went out as this was, as the city was burning, we went out to have a smoke uh, also, you know, a lot of stress. And because uh, and, we saw what was going on TV and we knew that right up the street there was something cooking. And this was our chance also to see something that we'd never seen before, which is an angry mob. And um, so we could hear, there was about 10, and it was, uh, had just, it was just after dark, I guess. Um, well, it was probably considerably after dark, but all of a sudden we could hear the chants and the screams of this crowd kind of getting louder and louder and louder. And literally, it was something like out of a movie with people with, uh, you know, those, what do they call those sticks that have the fire on them? You know, they light uh, tiki torches with them, except... Uh, um, anyway, sort of marching and chanting, and uh, as, they were, as they were coming, we could hear windows smashing um, all up, uh, coming up the street. Uh, when they got to the Times building, uh, it was, they went crazy. Uh, the Times, the symbol of establishment Los Angeles, um, you know, the cradle of racism, you know, they would say. So, um, the, uh, so they started, uh, it, was, it was convenient in a way because uh, the city had at the time been doing uh, road work right in front of the Times building. An entire block was being dug up and the, the remnants from that road work were piece, chunks of asphalt about this big. All a full city block of asphalt chunks like this. Well, this was like a great weapon. And uh, the entire mob sort of armed itself with these chunks of asphalt and uh, started try breaking into the Times building. We, were at, we, had, at the, uh, we decided to go back in when we could see down below and it was like totally out of control. When somebody said, screamed, get them, um, we thought it was best to kind of like grind out the smokes and go back in. <laughs> um, so the... Uh, they, they started, people started breaking through the ground floor um, built into the building. They sealed the, our secu crack security guards, um, who it wasn't their finest hour either, uh, managed to seal off the, uh, the lobby of the building. And so uh, the rioters got inside the building and uh, broke out all the ground floor office windows, uh, stole computers. Um, and as one, now, I didn't see this myself but it's the legend now and uh, it's certainly the company line is uh is that uh, the editor-in-chief shelby coffee um uh, while people were breaking into the building armed himself with a pair of long scissors and uh, thwarted the advance of a mob one flank of the mob coming into the building um he's gotten some mileage off that and and who am i to contradict whether that happened or not i <laughs> certainly wouldn't do that because he's my boss and uh, a brave boss, I might add. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, around the same time, we were, um, we were moving on to deadline. And, uh, and we had several deadlines through the evening. Um, we have a first edition. The deadline is 5 o'clock. Uh, well, clearly, there's nothing that we could really say other than we got the, the verdict, uh, the main verdict story in, uh, that, they, that there had been acquittals, not guilty verdicts. Um, and then we had another uh, deadline at uh, 10.30, and we had a final deadline at midnight. 
Uh, so now we were working on the 10, 30, 11 o'clock deadline, and uh, I was editing. My, part of my job was to um, edit the main story um, for basically throughout the duration of the unrest. Um, and uh, we're talking about, uh, I don't know how, how you in your, in your newspaper, student paper, measure the length of stories, whether it's by words or by inches, but we do it by inches. And uh, each, uh, the, the lead stories were somewhere around 110 inches um, every night. And uh, that's a hell of an edit on deadline, and it's, uh, and it's tough to write that much stuff. And I can tell you a little bit about later um, how you go about putting together a story like that uh, that, that quickly. But while we were trying to edit that story and a million others that were coming at the same time, uh, which would eventually fill 14 open inside pages of paper, um, we, uh, there were literally, there were rocks. We were on the third floor, um, but that mob was still down below. Um, but there were rocks bouncing off the windows. We had these thick sort of plexiglass windows and, and you could just hear it. It was, it was, it was kind of unnerving. Um, and it, it was unnerving, but at the same time, it was uh, in a weird way, and uh, in, in, a, in a way only a journalist would probably look at this. It was fascinating um, because it was you knew we knew that there was this piece of uh, urban history being made, and uh, and we felt that we were sort of on top of our game. Uh, Finally got the, the paper to bed that night at about, you know, after the midnight deadline. It wasn't clear how much damage there was in the city, but, um, but what we did every single night was after, after midnight, uh, when the paper got to bed, the editors would meet and discuss the strategy for the next day. Um, this was important because we had so many reporters that you couldn't, like, come in at, like, 9 o'clock the next morning and you know, while the city's burning and you have like 100 reporters standing at the city desk saying, okay, well, what am I gonna do today? Um, you had to be totally organized and structured and, and leave flexibility, but there's stories that you knew you wanted that you had to map out. So we would meet until about two o'clock in the morning. Um, we mapped out the second day strategy, which is the day that we won the Pulitzer for. Um, and uh, just, uh, we would uh, then, after we'd map out the strategy, we'd sit down and write everybody's assignment out. And we ended, I think, I remember that first night we got done about 3 o'clock in the morning, and we were thinking, number, you know, we had some 30 stories that we had prepared for the next day that we knew that we were going to do the next day. And, um, and number, like, I can remember it so vividly, like number 26 on the list, and this gives you an idea of news value, about how big a story this was for us in Los Angeles. Uh, the 26th story on the list was uh, a story about an, uh, a closer look at, uh, a, uh, at a two white motorcyclists in Long Beach who had been confronted by a, a mob, were yanked off the motorcycle and beaten to death on the street. Um, that was the 26th story on the list. And so we thought, I, did, I remember the, myself and the city editor looking at each other, just kind of shaking our heads going, Shh, this is pretty rough stuff. Um, if that can't even break into the top 10. So um, there was, uh, you know, the second day by, by sunrise, it was the city, it, it was clear that things were not going to be any better at all. There was like ash everywhere. As one of our photographers said, it was like the sky looked like, you know, a setting, it had the color of the setting sun that wasn't setting. It was just fires everywhere. And this day, what characterized it was the mass looting. And I'm sure you've seen pictures on TV or something of that. Um, the looting was pretty incredible. Families going out looting. Um, we have a picture of, um, uh, that one of the more memorable pictures, I think, of a father and a son looting a sporting goods store. Um, and they both were under, e under each arm. Small boy, dad, under each arm. Have you ever seen those commercials for thigh masters? You know, Suzanne Summers and her thigh masters. They <laughs> They had, both of them had, had thigh masters. I mean, there was just the father and the son, they had four thigh masters tucked under their arms coming out of a sporting goods store. So there was a sense of surrealism to what was going on in the city. Um, it was things like that. It was like, it was like a different place. It was a diff different place altogether. For me, um, what I, also, I was trying, I would read the wires to make sure that I was kind of up on top of what was spreading around the city. and, and um, I lived in an area called in an area just outside of downtown called Silver Lake, and um, all of a sudden I saw on the wires that um, this this mini mall somebody somebody had driven there rammed their car through the through the the uh, corner store and the Radio Shack and the looting was like wild. Well, that's my that was my corner mini mall. That's where you know 
I went to get milk and smokes and stuff. And, and uh, so I saw that, and, uh, and for the first time, it, it stopped becoming a news story for me in a lot of ways. That, not, not that I was insensitive to what was going on in the city, but there was still some detachment from it. That was my neighborhood. I had a wife and a little infant son, you know, in, in our house just up the street from that. The National Guard, which arrived late, decided to use the Circuit City Electronics Store across the street from us as their major command post. And, um, and I got scared, you know. I called home, and as many of the, the uh, as everyone did, I should say, as everyone did, basically, and, and um, I made sure my wife got out, you know, got out of the house, went up and stayed with neighbors for a couple days, because we, we were staying at work and sleeping in a hotel downtown. So, um, you know, basically, I haven't seen the, um, the reporters, you know, were, again, the second day being beaten up and, and fired on and stuff, but, they, but there was the grace with, um, with the writing and the, and the way they conducted themselves. I've never seen anything like it. It was everybody rose way, way beyond their capabilities. And I think that's what happens in times of trauma and, and tragedy like that. Everybody all of a sudden, you know, you hear about people being able to do things with adrenaline that you never think you can do. Well, I think that there's a certain intelligence quotient that goes up as well because I'll tell you, it was really, it was pretty impressive to see. Actually, here's the, my visual aid. This was, um, this was the paper, the second day paper, which, um, which did win the prize. And, and um, here you've got a bunch of looters on the ground, all handcuffed and everything. But I want to just read you um, one, what I thought was, uh, was, was a really good lead. All of these, these were written under deadline, and, and, um, and it kind of gives you a feel for um, what the capabilities were of people. Um, let me find it here. <clears throat> this was a piece on um, the trucker Reginald Denny being beaten up. And it was written by a reporter named Lori Beckland, and it ended up this year winning the uh, Society of Professional Journalists National Award for Deadline Writing. At every watershed through time, it seems a face emerges to transfix a moment in history. In Vietnam, a naked girl fled napalm. In Tiananmen Square, a single student stared down a line of Chinese tanks. In Los Angeles last year, Rodney G. King lay prone and beaten. Now, a white gravel truck driver beat nearly into oblivion in South Los Angeles has become the face on the flip side of the Rodney King coin, the unofficial black-on-white response to the official white-on-black beating. And, um, which I thought was a pretty nicely, nice turn of phrase, and uh, written on deadline, and uh, it was that level of, uh, of excellence that I think uh, was recognized um, by the Pulitzer Board. You know, um, the riots touched every institution in Los Angeles. It touched, um, you know, City Hall. I mean, it just was, I can't even begin to describe how much, how life changed there. Uh, the soul searching that went on, the, uh, the fear, the paranoia, as you can see from the build up to the last, the latest verdicts, um, it was pretty incredible. The media, the, the world media was there waiting for the riot that didn't happen. But, um, and the LA Times being a major institution was not immune to that kind of soul searching and, uh, and rage that overtook the city. And uh, we had, uh, we had uh, a incredible amounts of, uh, of divisiveness on our own staff that, uh, that happened after the riots. Um, uh, racial strife among the reporters, um, polarization, uh, black reporters, Latino reporters, white reporters, uh, m some major spirited conflicts going on at the paper. Um, the riots became sort of a wake-up call to um, not only to Los Angeles but to all its, to its people too then, and gave a louder voice to people who felt that they hadn't been heard before, whether they were in the streets uh, throwing rocks and burning buildings or in offices such as the LA Times. and. Um, and, and we had, uh, it began, I think for us, the real conflict began when a, um, one that was a conflict that was difficult to, to go through, but it, it happened, uh, it started with a, a business editor um, who talked to the Oakland Tribune. And uh, this, this editor wasn't, wasn't in town at the time of the riots, but um, she, was, she had been dissatisfied with the way the Times had been hiring minorities and, and did use this as her opportunity to make some Make her uh, make herself visible, and uh, and she told the um, she told the Oakland Tribune in a widely circulated uh, quote 
that the city desk uh, at the Times, myself included, had used um, black reporters as cannon fodder to spare the lives of white reporters going into, into um, hard, uh, hard hit areas. Um, that we protected white reporters by sacrificing the lives of our newspaper's black reporters. Now that's a pretty heavy charge to make. And it was uh, totally untrue. I mean, we had, we had a rainbow of uh, reporters on the street. Um, and, uh, and, but that's, what began, that's where it began for us. For, that's what began basically um, almost a year of uh, intense scrutiny on our riot coverage and on our hiring policies. Um, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Columbia Journalism Review, Washington Journalism Review, uh, all did stories on the racial conflicts in our newsroom. At one point, uh, it's become known by other papers as the mini riot in the newsroom, but we had uh, what started with a discussion between a uh, black reporter and a, a white reporter, both women, uh, discussing what an Asian American reporter had written in editor and publisher about, um, about uh, reporters from our suburban areas being bussed in to cover the riot. And, um, and so it, this thing mushroomed uh, within, I'd say, 15 minutes. The entire staff was gathered in the newsroom. Um, my, my boss would say it was a spirited discussion. Um, I think that, that's, a, that's a, an understatement. There was hostility and there was yelling about um, who gets ahead and who doesn't get ahead and white backlash and black, lash, black backlash. And, um, uh, it got to the point where the city editor had to hold a meeting up, uh, up in one of our conference rooms uh, to allow people to vent. Um, it, was, it, was, it was pretty intense and, uh, and it was very destructive to the morale of the staff. Um, as somebody who tries to try to build morale and so people can go out and do their jobs, it was, it was very frustrating. Um, but there was a lot that came out of it. Uh, and things have settled down some now. The Times uh, acknowledging its, um, its, its shoddy uh, treatment of the black community by not really pushing into those areas um, because that, they feel that that's not where the money is. The ads aren't there. Started up a, a long overdue uh, central city section. Hired a lot of people and now has an, what I think is an excellent weekly, uh, tabloid weekly uh, that is uh, not puffy at all. It's, it's, uh, it's relevant and it's good. Um, we have a diversity committee that's just come back with reports. Uh, we're still in the midst of uh, some pretty heavy soul searching there. And I think the, the beauty, one of the beauties of being recognized uh, for a Pulitzer was, was that it was the first time that I had seen in a long time the staff together sort of pull together in some way. Everybody sort of smiling and happy about something that they had accomplished. Um, so I think I've talked enough. And if anybody wants to ask any questions, I'm certainly open for that. You said that you went through the process of uh, setting down your strategy on how you, you know, you're going to go out covering the day's events. Um, what, what are some of the things that uh, you looked at or you, know, you thought about as you went, you know, prioritizing you know, the things that you needed to do or setting your strategy? Well, some things, um, I th yeah, that's a good question. Um, when you have that many stories sort of cooking, it was, you know, you really do have to sort of be selective and, and what do you want to say. We felt that, that the, what we needed to do was be explanatory. Like I said, one of the big stories for us, obviously, after the first night was what happened to the police department. We knew that was a dead away, straight ahead story. People were watching the riot on the TV and they never saw a cop, ever. Um, so we knew that was something we had to do. The Reginald Denny beating, we knew we, that that was something we also wanted to do. And then we also, Los Angeles had, um, you know, had, had defined its reputation in many ways as being sort of a place where um, ethnic mix works. And so this clearly went up in smoke, um, literally. And so we knew that we had to try to explain that, the breakdown of the multicultural um, mix in Los Angeles. So what we had to do is just try to pick off what we thought were, were the most relevant stories and give the most, our most firepower, put our best reporters on those stories and try to match up uh, who we knew that Lori Becklin, for example, that wrote that, uh, the lead that I just read, we knew that she was, she's an excellent writer. So you want to put her on a story where her ability to write can shine. Um, so, I mean, that's basically, it was seat of the pants. A lot of it was just totally seat of the pants. Well, we know we need to do this. Um, we know we need to do that. Um, 
reporters came in with their own ideas and we accepted everything. I mean, everything was, if you got an idea, great, let's do it. Sounds great. Because it was hard to come up to tell the truth. It was hard to come up with a bad story. Every story was interesting. You couldn't really lose. I mean, nobody said, oh, that's kind of, that's kind of a boring idea. You know, one reporter said, you know what I want to do is I want to go spend the night tonight in Koreatown. And, uh, which had been hit really heavily um, by fires and looting. And there was a lot of gunfire that was going on there. And, uh, and so just wanted to spend the night there and did. Spent, spent the night in Koreatown with a vigilante group that had been set up to protect the store owners there. And uh, he did a page one story the next day, cranked it out. He's never been quite so fast in his life. Um, Cranked it out, long, beautifully written story with the headline, Firebase Koreatown, and it just took you inside. Um, and the reporters were all doing that. So they made the job a lot easier by coming up with their own ideas as well. Yeah? Well, you know, I was, I was trying to think about that earlier, and I'm not sure that they, that they actually did reserve that money, because I do remember that, um, I know they got this time around, they certainly got a lot of new equipment in the overtime, but I'm not sure, I can't answer the question, because I'm not sure that they actually did it, because I knew there was a big controversy about that, that Daryl Gates got beat up pretty badly when he suggested that the cops needed overtime. He was accused of being provocative. Um, in, in fairness, Daryl Gates, he was, he was, um, that was probably excessive, you know, criticism of him because he was just doing what he felt he needed to do. And, and uh, so I don't know what happened to the money because I'm not sure that it got, I know there was so much controversy over it even being done that I don't, are you sure it was uh, allocated? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and it said it was allocated or that it was requested? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened to it then. I wasn't. I, I'm not. I'm not sure. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Well, they're just now really starting to use it as a campaign issue in what's going to be un undoubtedly a nasty mayoral race in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, um, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, it depends on what... That riot is in the eye of the beholder in many ways. It is, what is it? Is it a riot? Is it a rebellion? Is it an insurrection? Um, I mean, there's a lot of political correctness attached to all that. And, um, and I'm not sure, you know, some people would say it, you know, very flatly would say what we had was it was lawlessness by thugs. Um, that's all it was. Others would, would, I think, go the other direction, too far the other direction, say this is purely a symptom of social, um, of the breakdown of society and helping the less fortunate. That it's, um, I think it's somewhere kind of in between there, you know. So in, in terms of distorting it, it's, you know, I think it's distorted by, I think it, it has a natural tendency to be distorted based on your own perception of what the role of government is and what people should do and self-responsibility and determination, all those things. That answers your question. But clearly, the, in the current mayor's race, one of the candidates, uh, Richard Reardon, um, is using it as a symbol of, I won't let this shit happen again. You know, that's... Anything else? Yeah. yeah. Sir, on that note, um, what was your reaction professionally to the second riot, and, I mean, excuse me, the second trial, and what kind of preparation went into it? Uh, we were unbelievably prepared. That was talking about overkill but you had to but but it, like everybody you know I mean it, there was good reason for it because we could see what happened the last time and it was only a year later and the conditions were the same if not worse than they were because nothing had really been done to correct uh, what some of the problems that people said existed in various areas you know except a lot of lip service 
Um, so we were, we were real prepared this time. We called, we had a lot of reporters. We knew, we had stories mapped out. Um, we had beepers, we had um, gas masks, we had uh, bullet resistant vests, we had uh, cellular phones. We were, we were prepared this time. And, um, and, but I, you know, there's, there's a lot, been a lot of talk about, um, you know, the media and whether it was trying to provoke um, a riot this time around. And, you know, I mean, I just think that was so, some, some of the coverage was sensational, particularly by TV. Um, but the reality is that we didn't write a single word the first time about the potential for violence. Not a word. So there was no provocation there, and look what happened. So these things happen on their own. I think the media t has taken a really unfair blame for that. But I personally, um, I think there's probably a few people, a few reporters that were sort of, um, well, maybe more than a few reporters. There was, there was in a, in some editors who thought, hmm, another riot. God, wasn't the first one great fun? And, um, and, uh, and, and, it is, and it was on some level um, in sort of that journal, dark gallows journalistic way um, where that thrives off of disaster um, and misfortune. Um, it, was, it was exhilarating. And, um, and, and it was difficult and challenging. So I think there's some people that probably want to see something happen again. And, uh, but but for, my, for my family life, um, I was real glad that it didn't. Um, I was very glad because I, I, I'll tell you, um, if you live in Los Angeles, um, this is more than a story. You know, it's, it's where you live. It's your life. And you could feel, especially in the months immediately following the riots, you could feel the tension. You could feel people looking at each other warily and I mean, and it's still like that. I mean, I'm now, more, I'm far more afraid in the city than I ever was before. I would go anywhere before with no fears at all. And I did that for eight years as a reporter, getting myself into situations that I would today, I, I wouldn't do. I just, it just wouldn't do it. Um, just because there's a level of, of anger and hostility all around that doesn't lend itself to that as well. So for me, and I think a lot of other people, the majority of people, it was great that nothing happened because it said something positive about the place where I just bought a house and I don't want the value of it to drop to nothing and I want my kids to be able to go to good schools where there's not going to be fighting and shootings all the time and, and there was some sense of hope about it. Um, so I would much rather have edited the story, which I did, on, on the riot that never happened um, and the unfolding of a day of peace in Los Angeles, which is what we ended up doing on that day, um, than, than yet another firestorm. Now that's not to say that there aren't more flashpoints along the way. There's uh, sentencing for the officers on August 4th and there's a, the trial of the defense, three, three remaining defendants in the uh, Reginald Denny beating case. Um, we were, when we were doing uh, stories uh, in preparation for, the, for this most recent King trial, we were hearing from people in the community, gang members primarily, that, oh, pff, screw Rodney King. We already did a riot for him, you know. Now, you know, who, who cares about Rodney King? He's a sellout. He's going for a settlement of his lawsuit. He's going to be a millionaire. Screw him. You know, what we're, what we're interested in is the defendants um, who are being accused of beating Denny because an unequal application of the law, they believe, is being applied to them versus what was applied to the police officers. So that's where, that's where the flashpoint is next. So just lurching from one crisis to the next, sort of. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a mix. I mean, clearly, some people that uh, were burned out, merchants that were burned out, had no intention of going back. We're seeing a lot of, uh, especially Korean-born merchants, uh, moving into other areas, out into Ventura, um, uh, you know, which is a little bit north of us uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, there's, there hasn't been a lot of rallying around to help people rebuild their places. Um, that hasn't happened. There's a there's large move underfoot to, um, to block the, the rebuilding of uh, liquor stores in, in areas of the city where there was a proliferation of them. 
that's a nasty fight between the merchants and members of the community who say enough already. Uh, there's, there's too many liquor stores already here. So there's not, in terms of rebuilding, there, isn't, there hasn't been a hell of a lot. I mean, you can drive through the city and still see mangled wreckage. Yeah. You said that uh, television cameras kind of served as your eyes during the riots. Mm -hmm. I wonder how much the editors emphasis they put on covering stories that were seen on television. I mean, did you have to go after stories that people watched on the evening news to make sure that you had it? No, not really. In fact, what we tried to do was create the agenda uh, for the most part. What TV did, though, for us was it allowed us to see the literal hot spots. You know, because it wasn't so much, the, the thing was, it's hard to describe, but it was unfolding so fast. It was like you'd, you'd, you'd see some, one part of the city building after building burning, and you go, oh, geez, God, look how bad that is. And all of a sudden, a whole new section of the city, Hollywood, for example, Hollywood Boulevard, famed, Walk of Fame, you know, Man's Chinese or Grauman's Chinese Theater, whatever the hell it's called now, um, you, know, you know, that street is burning on fire. So. It was, un, un, it was, it was uh, unfolding so quickly, it was impossible to keep up with it uh, unless you had a helicopter, um, which is what TV did. They blanketed the skies with helicopters so they could listen to police scanners and fire department scanners and pick up where the fires were happening. So then we could then, made it easier for us to deploy reporters directly to where we were seeing, um, where we were seeing the problem areas were. So in that sense, it was a great help, but we didn't feel a need to, to match what they were doing. They were on top of a breaking story that we were trying to be stay on top of as well. One more question. Did your police reporters take a lead role in that coverage? They took a very good role in it, yeah. Especially, um, we did, um, because the police, was, the, the police uh, presence was, or lack of was such a big issue, um, which some people said really is what, what triggered you know, the, the spreading mayhem is that, that nobody saw on TV any police around. Um, we just went to town on police stories, um, including, um, you know, we had a string of, of probably six, six days, five or six days where the police story actually led the newspaper, was the banner headline. You know, getting transcripts from people like 911 calls, for example, coming into the police department. Um, very enterprising stuff where 911 calls would come in, people screaming, you know, my house is being burned, or, or you know, help, I'm seeing people being shot, and, and with no response by the police department. At the same time, the police were pulling back off the street, at the same time these 911 calls were coming in. So our police reporters who are investigative by nature, I mean, we try to cover the police department in a very sort of balls out sort of way. Um, uh, they took a, a very significant role in the coverage. Was there a reason you asked that particular question? I just was curious. I was uh, I'm just kind of experienced working with police reporters here with how they try to keep up with standards and run around town. I can imagine them being all done now and want to get in. Yeah, well, they, um, they are. Our police reporters, we do have reporters like that that are just drool to get out of the street. Our police reporters have tended not to be like that. They're um, an interest, different, little different breed. They're, they'd rather like work the phones and work sources and do um, exposés on brutality in the department and that kind of stuff. They're not your typical sort of um, uh, cop beat reporters. Um, we have plenty of those um, who like to do that, but we, we do it a little differently with the police reporters. Being a former police reporter myself, I can kind of understand that. Yeah. What's the, what was the racial composition of the newsroom at the time of the riots, and has it changed in the last year? Yeah, it has. Um, thank you for asking that question. Um, actually, the, the racial composition of the newsroom um, kind of ebbs and flows, and it was, uh, we had what I think is not nearly enough Latino reporters. We had um, primarily, um, let me think here. We probably had five, we had five or six black reporters in the newsroom, in the main metro office newsroom, then the suburban areas. Pardon me? Probably about 40, 45 reporters, I think, assigned down to the metro, to the metro staff. And we have probably five or six. That's just on the hard news side. There's other people in calendar, our, which is our entertainment section, and our, our view section, which is our feature section. Um, there, um, there is one, two, three Latinos, which I think is, is 
incredibly bad, considering that 43% of the city is Latino. Um, we don't have a lot of Spanish speakers. Um, we, you know, we have a handful, five, six Spanish speakers. Uh, since then, we've brought up uh, two, two new black reporters, uh, two new Latino reporters, one of whom we hired recently from the Wall Street Journal in Los Angeles um, as an urban affairs writer. Um, the City Times, that new section that we created, um, that has hired, that's almost all um, minority journalists. Um, so, uh, and we hired one uh, Asian American. So, I mean, it's still, uh, I think the representation, last I heard, the, met, the metro representation was 17% um, minority. I think that's the last I heard. 